Click subscribe to receive notifications from the latest videos. Thank you. The original Corker Trump feud. 50 years ago, LBJ was locked in a fight with another chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Here's what happened. Last week, when Tennessee Senator Bob Corker lobbed a rhetorical grenade at President Donald Trump, likening his White House to an adult daycare center and expressing public concern that the commander-in-chief was reckless enough to start World War III, Washington hands called the comments alarming. And when the president shot back, launching a Twitter rampage against Little Bob and blaming him for the horrendous Iran deal, they said the burgeoning feud was unprecedented. It was certainly unusual, but it wasn't unprecedented. Fifty years ago, Lyndon Johnson was locked in a bitter feud with another chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, J. William Fulbright, an Arkansas Democrat who came to doubt both the wisdom of America's war in Vietnam and LBJ's fundamental honesty about its cost, scale and outlook. There was more to their fight than just two proud men differing over an issue. Johnson resented Fulbright not just for second-guessing his foreign policy but for surfacing fundamental defects in his leadership style, defects that would ultimately prove his undoing. Their rancor may offer a lens through which to understand the hot war between Trump and Corker. Fulbright and Johnson had known each other for 25 years at the time of their falling out. They served together in the House of Representatives from 1941 to 1945, and while Fulbright beat LBJ to the Senate by four years, he would prove a loyal member of the Southern Caucus that elevated Johnson to the post of majority leader. The two men were of sharply contradictory dispositions, LBJ was earthy and coarse, while Fulbright, a former Rhodes Scholar who became president of the University of Arkansas at the unlikely young age of 35, was urbane and erudite. Not everyone appreciated his frequent lapses into sophistry. Harry Truman called him an overeducated Oxford SOB, while Johnson would later quip that Fulbright was an egghead who was unable to park his bicycle straight, but he was a smart, conscientious legislator whose mastery of foreign policy was nearly unparalleled in the capital. And for all intents and purposes, he got along and went along fine with Johnson. Though Fulbright was an early skeptic of the Kennedy administration's policies in Southeast Asia, and though in late 1963 he counseled Johnson not to escalate America's presence there, the following August the Foreign Relations Chair voted for the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which authorized the administration to use all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the armed forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. The precipitating event was a suspected North Vietnamese attack on an American gunboat in the Gulf of Tonkin. As America's involvement in Vietnam spiraled, in February 1965 American forces began a massive bombing campaign against North Vietnamese and National Liberation Front targets, later dubbed Operation Rolling Thunder, and by the end of the year over 150,000 U.S. troops were stationed in country, Fulbright grew convinced that he had made a mistake. He regarded the conflict as an anti-colonial fight rather than a proxy fight with China and the Soviet Union. More importantly, he was convinced that Johnson was in the wrong, a conviction that grew in January 1966, when the administration ended a Christmas season halt to the bombings. On the evening of January 31st, just hours after the White House announced a resumption of rolling thunder, Fulbright appeared on CBS Evening News the gold standard of American reportage, to denounce the war as morally unjust and strategically unwise. He then launched weeks of high-profile, televised hearings featuring an all-star lineup of foreign policy and military skeptics of Johnson's war policy. General James Gavin called for a limitation of ground troops, while George Kennan, the dean of American foreign policy, urged that the government wind down its involvement as soon as this could be done without inordinate damage to our prestige or stability in the area. Adding fuel to the fire, later that year Fulbright published a book, The Arrogance of Power, which functioned as a takedown of U.S. foreign policy in Vietnam. The arrogance to which he referred was America's, generally, and not LBJ's, specifically. But by then the breach was irreversible. 
Johnson had assiduously attempted to woo his former colleague and had been rewarded by public condemnation. Fulbright was a crybaby, Johnson complained to his aide even in early 1965, and I can't continue to kiss him every morning before breakfast. Fulbright would later claim that after he broke publicly with the administration war's policy, the president never after that had another private conversation with me. That recollection wasn't true. As a wartime president, Johnson could ill afford to shun the chairman of a committee with considerable oversight powers. Indeed, multiple recordings exist of private phone calls between the two men well into LBJ's last months in office, including a moving conversation in which Johnson read aloud a dispatch from his son-in-law, Charles Robb, who was then serving in Vietnam. But their relationship had grown icy. In an interview years after the fact, one of Fulbright's staffers attending a White House reception after his boss broke with LBJ. When he sought to shake hands with Johnson, he remembered, the president looked at me, right through me, and said, what are you doing here? I was never invited back. Fulbright's opposition to the war wasn't what drove him to a breaking point with Johnson. Other members of Congress came to doubt the wisdom of American foreign policy, and it didn't necessitate a breach. Indeed. LBJ was a fervent pragmatist who valued loyalty but also appreciated political reality. Just as he didn't cut off his mentor and close friend, Richard Russell, for voting against both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, he didn't cut off Fulbright, who, for all his erudition and moderation, also opposed both signature Great Society measures. Instead, their falling out came when Fulbright shone a bright spotlight on Johnson's Achilles heel. Johnson would later rue the day he left the woman I love, the Great Society, in order to fight that bitch of a war. It was true. He was never firmly sold on its necessity, but he was convinced that if I don't go in now and they show later that I should have, they'll push. Vietnam up my ass every time. There was some truth to it. Polling revealed a strong public mandate to stop communist aggression, everywhere. The foreign policy and Pentagon establishment was almost nearly unanimous in its support of the war. The Republican Party, which had nominated the Cold War hawk Barry Goldwater as its standard bearer 1964, would have relished the chance to paint LBJ as soft on communism had he de-escalated the war. Yet the president was boxed in. To admit how deeply the administration had committed itself, LBJ would have to acknowledge the cost of the war, which rose to over $20 billion annually by 1967. Wartime spending was overheating the economy, draining federal resources and threatening Johnson's ability to fund his great society programs. As his budget director Charles Schultz later observed, the problem was for all sorts of reasons an unwillingness to admit publicly the war was going to cost a lot more. LBJ feared that if he admitted the full scope of engagement, or if he embraced the advice of both Schultz and Gardner Ackley, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisers, that the administration raise personal and corporate income taxes to prevent the economy from overheating, he would box himself into a corner with Congress. Because obviously the whole game of the Republicans, naturally, would have been. Why the devil should we give you these extra taxes when you won't tell us how much more the war is going to cost? So Johnson had dissembled. It didn't help matters that liberal congressmen continued to authorize spending on great society programs at levels far in excess of what the White House requested or approved. Johnson was in a bind, the war was eating up a growing portion of the federal budget and, along with domestic spending, was accelerating price and wage inflation. He couldn't satisfy liberal demands for even more domestic spending, but he also couldn't admit why. The administration had raised great expectations, a Democratic congressman admonished. Hugh Carey, a Democrat from New York, lamented that Congress was being forced to make a choice here between books and bullets. After all, polling suggested that while wide support still existed for the war effort in Vietnam, Fully 72% of Americans opposed cuts to domestic programs as a trade-off for increased military appropriations. In pledging that America could do it all, have guns and butter, fight poverty and communism, ensure sustained economic growth with low inflation, 
the president had promised more than he could deliver in wartime. James Scheuer, a congressman from New York, attributed liberal frustration to the administration's own eloquence and your own creativity in wetting our appetites. When he launched his hearings on Vietnam, which subsequently resumed in 1967, it wasn't just that Fulbright was picking apart Johnson's war policy. He was exposing the war, its costs and its meaning. That, to Johnson, was unforgivable. William Fulbright and Bob Corker are not the same person. Though widely admired by his colleagues for his steady demeanor and moral probity, Corker hasn't shown anywhere near the same independence from his party's president that Fulbright displayed. And Donald Trump isn't Lyndon Johnson. Not yet, and maybe not ever, by any measure of intellect, competency, purpose or achievement. But there is something telling in these dual tales of disharmony between two headstrong presidents and two chairmen of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Fulbright surfaced something that Johnson knew to be true but couldn't bear to acknowledge. Vietnam wasn't the war he wanted, Lady Bird Johnson later said of her husband. The one he wanted was on poverty and ignorance and disease and that was worth putting your life into. By making it more difficult for Johnson to deny the depth of America's commitment in Southeast Asia, Fulbright exposed the devil's bargain that the president had made. Corker might also have surfaced something real. Trump regards himself as a born leader, steady of hand, with instincts that confound expertise and wisdom that can't be learned in books. But his presidency has thus far been gravely unsettling to elected officials, civil society, military officials, and citizens in the United States and well beyond. It has also been unsuccessful, as measured by legislative or moral achievement. In a rare moment of peak, Corker surfaced that truth. Like Johnson, Trump snapped back. Thank you for watching this video. If you find this video interesting please like and share to many friends know. Do you have any questions please comment below to let everyone know. And do not forget to click on the subscribe button to receive notifications from the latest videos. Goodbye and see you again.